So today, I want to focus on, on an interesting topic that I hope every one of you are very interested, in, which is scaling and database scaling in general and Postgres scaling in particular. Now, what I want to talk about today is look at successful stories. And DynamoDB, as I will explain, is a very successful database or application, as we'll sell you later, that scales amazingly well. So one of my goals is to look at other projects outside of the Postgres realm, where most of us are usually moving around and look, at, look outside and see what we can learn from other projects and hopefully bring them in some other way to Postgres land. And so today, we're going to do a small study about DynamoDB, how it works internally, not what the API looks like or how to use DynamoDB, but rather how it works internally and understanding how it works internally and how it scales, achieves the massive scales that it does if there's an opportunity to something similar in Postgres. Hence the title, can Postgres scale like DynamoDB, like following the same principles that DynamoDB does. And so we shall see whether this is possible or not. Feel free to uh, write questions on the chat window. Um, I will not be able to read Russian questions. I'll try to, uh, but obviously I will have some, some translation helpers if not. Uh, obviously feel free to write in English or even in Spanish. And I'll take questions more or less at the end. But you can also write down what your bet is. Can we make ever Postgres to scale like DynamoDB or this is gonna be absolutely impossible? So feel free to already drop just a yes or no or da or net or whatever. And, and we'll see who, this is like a contest. Let's see who wins the contest. So just before starting, let me also do the compulsory who am I for the slide. I am the founder of C and CEO of a company called Ongress. Ongress means on Postgres, uh, as a short for on Postgres. So it should be pretty obvious what we do. Most of you probably will know us already. We're a Postgres highly specialized company. Um, I've been using Postgres for almost all my professional life. I started using it more than 20 years ago. Yes, it's now Postgres birthday. It's older than, than the time I've been using it, uh, but still I've been using it for such a long time. So by the way, congratulations Postgres for such a successful professional career. And I spend most of my time trying to innovate and to do research and development on databases and obviously specifically Postgres or other databases to bring things to Postgres and, and to innovate. As such as I have been the principal architect behind some uh, very innovative projects like ToroDB some years ago, which is a software for uh, doing live migration of data from MongoDB to Postgres while transforming uh, documents into relational structures in Postgres, or nowadays Stackgres, which is Postgres on Kubernetes platform, very innovative, very disruptive, platform for running Postgres on Kubernetes, with the, which you should check. And um, I do a lot of community work. I, I belong to Postgres community, have created the Postgres user group in Spain, as well as a nonprofit organization, a foundation called Fundación Postgres QL. I'm doing a lot of talks uh, at Postgres uh, and other uh, conferences like this one. And so, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Feel free to ping me anywhere uh, on Twitter, email, LinkedIn. I'm available. So let's dig first a little bit into DynamoDB, what it is, what is it good for, and how it scales. So the first thing we should ask ourselves is, is DynamoDB good? Because that is trendy or, or repu reputated or you know, like well-known, doesn't tell me anything. There's a lot of technologies which are not so good for me that are very famous or, or very much used by users. That's not a measure of success in my opinion. But if you look at, for example, uh, what has been over the, the, the last few years, the Amazon Prime Day, Amazon Prime Day is this, this three years, two, three days, it's not a single day, right? Where the Amazon has some very good deals and offers and people go and purchase a lot of stuff. And uh, they use a lot of AWS, Amazon resources for doing this, you know, that obviously DynamoDB is an Amazon uh, web services exclusive software uh, service. So if we look at these numbers, uh, we see that DynamoDB actually achieved amazing, very impressive numbers. So here we can read from this quote on, made on this blog post that DynamoDB API, DynamoDB 
is exposed, the database exposes a REST API, okay, HTTP API, more precisely. So this API served 16.4 trillion calls and it peaked at 80 million requests per second, which actually on 2021, which was a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago, it reached almost 90 million requests per second. This is actually quite impressive. If you think about it, 90 million operations per second is a pretty large number. We can discuss what are these requests, whether they are small things or big transactions, um, but it doesn't matter. Even if they're tiny operations, 90 million operations per second is a really, really high number of operations. And this is already impressive by itself. We can discuss that maybe this was split among several tables. DynamoDB calls the unit of work a table. Postgres will say it's equivalent to a, a cluster, but it doesn't really matter, even if it was spread across several tables, because DynamoDB essentially is a multi tenant service. So there were, even though it was probably only for Amazon, these numbers, they were probably split into many tenants. Again, still 90 million operations per second is a pretty hefty number. Let's compare this number just to give some perspective to another high number I can tell you about a Postgres cluster. So look at this example. This is, uh, this is all public information, so I, I, it's something I can definitely disclose and talk about. This is about one of our customers, Ongers customers, called GitLab.com. You probably know them, right? They're like GitHub. Um, this is slightly different service. And their main platform, GitLab.com, is, which is serving millions of users, is, a very, is, is, is backed by a single Postgres cluster composed of uh, approximately a dozen nodes, one primary and many replicas. And in overall, all this cluster, this is a single cluster, but this cluster is picking around 300,000 transactions per second. So look at the scale we're talking about here. DynamoDB, we're talking about 90 million operations per second. Maybe there are several tenants, so let's say that a, a tenant is doing millions of operations per second. Here we're talking about a peak of uh, 300,000 operations per, or transactions per second. We might argue that maybe these transactions are heavier than DynamoDBs, but still it's a difference in scale between hundreds of thousands to millions up to 90 millions. So two or three orders of magnitude more performance for achieved. So again, the question is, we love this, we would like to see if we can make something similar in Postgres. DynamoDB, other than the performance, is a building block for other services. Internally, Amazon uses DynamoDB as a backend store for many of the services. Uh, mentioned here is uh, SQS, the queuing service, the auto scaling service uh, for Amazon instances, the EC2 service, CloudWatch, all the monitoring goes also to DynamoDB the console, and possibly others. These are, uh, I just captured this because they were known to be disrupted when there was an outage on DynamoDB. So we obviously know that they are, they are based on them. It's actually mentioned. So it's interesting. This is very powerful, very fast, and it's a building block. But so then why? Why is it so popular? Why Amazon uses for critical services like Prime Day and all the, all the services? Why people like DynamoDB all the damn performance, right? So let's try to understand first what it is to understand why it's so good thing. First of all, it is a scale out NoSQL database. And scale out means that you can grow as much as you want. There's potentially no limits to the size or the performance that you need to DynamoDB. You can start very small and grow very large and it will work the same way. It is also NoSQL database. Uh, even though there's a concept of a table, there's really no relational concept. There's, there's, there's no relationships, there's no foreign keys. We'll talk, there's no joins. It's a NoSQL database. And it's based on an augmented key value model where the key is, is, a, is a primary key. We're gonna discuss what it is, can be simple or composite. And then there's a value. And the value can be kind of a JSON document. It's not really JSON, but we can map it conceptually to a JSON, a JSON document uh, with a limitation that cannot be more than 400 kilobytes. But other than that, is you know key value where the key may be simple or composite and value adjacent. So schema less unstructured uh, nested fields. So you can you can input some richness into this into this model. 
and internal unit types, supports maps, lists, sets, and scalar values. So, so it's quite rich being a key value store from, uh, from, uh, from that perspective. What is really interesting about DynamoDB is its performance, apart from being potentially very high, it is consistent at any scale. So DynamoDB makes this claim that its performance, all its operations are performed always uh, what is called single digit millisecond, which in other words means below 10 milliseconds. And this is an interesting number, we'll, we'll keep in mind. The other characteristic is that it, it is serverless and well, uh, bustling uh, around the term, it just basically means that you don't need to manage servers. You don't even need to think about it because you don't provision based on CPU cores or memory or RAM or storage or anything. You just say, I want a table. And you, what you specify is the write performance that you want to have and the read performance you want to have. These are specified on units called WRCU and, and uh, RCU, sorry, WCU and RCU, which stands for write compute units and read compute units. They are not cores or anything like that. They are just the amount of operations per second that you want uh, to be tapped at. So you say, okay, I wanna have a thousand write operations per second and 5,000 read operations per second. So just ask for a thousand WCUs and uh, 5,000 RCUs and that, that you will get that performance. You want 10 times that, you ask for that, and you pay for that, of course, and that's it. So that's, that's the model. You don't think about course memory or anything, but rather IO performance, essentially. And obviously, you also pay for storage and data transfer. So it's, it's absolutely pay per use. If you, if you just want a database to store a few data points every hours, you'll basically pay nothing. So it's, it's also convenient to get started with. Now, what it makes it so successful based on this characteristics that I told you, what makes it so successful? Yeah, that is serverless. A lot of people nowadays like serverless and you don't need to manage, you don't need to think, just go click, uh, drop down, select, or the, from the CLI, create a table and use it. It's very simple. In one command, on CLI, for example, you'll get it started. And you don't need to think about this. You specify the WCUs, RCUs, and that's it. Or, e, or even you can even set up dynamic provisioning for the capacity and it will scale up and down according to some criteria. You didn't really need to think about anything, just start using it. Also, yeah, it's uh, interesting that you can scale without limits. You can scale to 90 million operations per second, but to be honest, not everybody needs to scale to 90 million operations per second unless you're Amazon, but there's only one Amazon or couple if you consider all their similar competitors, Alibaba maybe, even though they're not using DynamoDB. So you don't have this scale. So it's very good that you can scale as much as you need, but in reality, maybe you don't need that much of a scale. But anyway, it's, it's good to have, right? So it's kind of also, yeah. So yeah, it's serverless, yeah, it can scale. But the reality, the main reason why DynamoDB is so interesting is the consistency of the performance. And the performance, I'm talking mostly about the latency. On databases, it's becoming more and more critical to understand the latency of their operations. The time bound that you have for an operation to succeed or to, re or to return an error. Because this consistency is what makes the high percentiles to be acceptable and then complain with all your SLOs for the application and make sure the experience of the application using the database is also consistent to the user, which is sensitive to high latencies. And DynamoDB promises, this promise is not always fulfilled, but mostly, let's say, yes. Um, and when it is not, it's because of some special operations that are, that are available. Uh, but in general, you can expect almost all operations to execute below 10 milliseconds. And at any scale, it doesn't matter if you have one kilobyte of data or, or petabytes of data, you'll still get operations below 10 milliseconds. And this is what is really compelling about DynamoDB. But wait, 10 milliseconds? That, 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 that's not really fast. Postgres can do way better than that, right? Postgres can do queries in one millisecond, in less than milliseconds. In microseconds, you can, you can ask uh, or queries. If, if you test on your laptop, you'll get better performance than this. So is, 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 why is this so special? Well, the reality is that you can get faster results with Postgres, but not at any scale. 
try with a small database and make it larger to make it larger to keep getting it larger and try to see even if you're accessing by primary key you have the appropriate index well if you have primary key, you have obviously an appropriate index uh, you will start increasing slowly it's logarithmic but at some time you'll definitely get past this 10 milliseconds and if you try a little bit more complicated operations you'll soon exceed this budget then you'll see what the effect us is in postgres about checkpoints and and all the uh, on vacuum and all these operations are going to increase significantly under production scenarios your tail latency so if you look at your p99 or p95 latency percentiles you're going to see that you definitely exceed this and that's the beauty of DynamoDB that makes these operations run almost warranted there's no actually warranty from an sla perspective but the experience shows that they deliver on this promise of single digit millisecond latencies so this is what makes really DynamoDB so special so how data is structured and this is important for us to understand now we're going to dive into the internals of DynamoDB, how it is structured and how it works internally. This will help us understand how they can achieve this consistent latency of the operations. So basically, when we insert a document, uh, let's call it document for simplicity because it can contain nested structures, it is going to have a primary key and the attributes. Let's look at the primary key first. The primary key, as I mentioned before, can be simple or composite. If it's simple, which is the, the picture here in the middle, it will just contain what is called the partition key. So the primary key will equal a partition key. Guess what it is? It is a key by which data is going to be partitioned. Well, we're going to see this later. So it's called the partition key. And the partition key, it's something which uh, will distribute, you should select as a partition key, something that will distribute the data more or less uniformly. So something with a high cardinality. For example, in this example, we're talking about users. And if I pick a user ID, which is probably a number, and it will change per user, they're going to have thousands, millions of users. Uh, this is going to probably be a good, a good partition key because it's going to distribute more or less uniformly with some caveats, but yeah, should work. And then the attributes. The attributes is a schema-less, free-form JSON document, so I can say whatever. I can change from row to row. I can have name and surname, later name and not surname, and age, whatever I want. Right? If the primary key is composite, then it's also going to have the same a partition key, and it's going to have a second key called a sort key. It cannot be more. There cannot be more than a true tuple. And the first one is going to be the partition key. The second one is going to be a sort key. The sort key is part of a primary key that is used for having values that have the same partition key ordered by the second uh, key, the sort key. So, for example, uh, on, on this example, if I'm having sensor data and I want to uniquely identify every row on this sensor data by uh, two fields. One is going to be the device ID, which is a good candidate for a partition key because they will be spread more or less uniformly. But then if I want to read all the data of a given sensor I, and in order, a particular order, then I can use the timestamp, which is the sort key in this example, to sort them out. And obviously, the combination of the partition key and the sort key in this example, the device ID and the timestamp, they have to be unique, not null, because they are, the, they are the primary key. So this is how the data model works. Now let's look at the role of the partition key, which is important here. And this relates to the sharding logic. So to scale, DynamoDB uses sharding. This, uh, this should be pretty obvious, right? And the way it does the sharding is by uh, using this partition key. So you take a document, you have the partition key, uh, the potential the sort key and the attributes. Yes, let's extract for this purpose the partition key. And you apply a hash function. It's not revealed what which hash, fun, hash function it uses, but you know, probably a good hash function. And this generates a value. Now, this value called XYZ in this example, we're going to map it to a, a topology called a ring. A ring is just a circle. And you spread the partitions that you have. These partitions are going to be servers. Right? You, um, they're called partitions. For us, uh, Postgres land, let's call it servers, if you like. So these partitions, which map to servers, are spread more or less uniformly. It doesn't need to actually could be randomly placed on a circle. And then when I find the value, in this case, x, y, z, I also map this value into the circle and then move, for example, clockwise. 
And the first partition that I meet will be the partition where this value needs to be stored. So in this case, I take the partition key, I make a hash of it, I map this value into the circle, it goes to a place between partition two and partition three according to this graph. Then I move clockwise and see that this x, y, z maps to partition three. So this is, this is called ring topology. And so with this, I know that I need to store this document into the partition tree. So how does it work exactly? In reality, behind the scenes, the architecture of DynamoDB looks like an application, an HTTP application, uh, where the user is speaking this HTTP or HTTPS because that's a DynamoDB API and goes to a DNS entry point. Uh, DynamoDB is exposed as a DNS, uh, a regional one, so it's so one per continent, if you want to call it that way. And this DNS is going to load balance across a fleet of what I call the HTTP servers or request routers. Uh, these request routers are basically the entities that compute the hash and decide which partition this is going to belong to. And so in this case, let's say that it's going to be the bottom request router, the one who receives this particular request from the user, is going to compute the hash, is going to realize that this needs to go to partition three, and then it will go to server, uh, the server where this partition three is stored for this particular user, and we'll, we'll call this uh, storage nodes, and we'll go to the storage node to execute the operation. By the way, mind you that this is multi-tenant environment, so on a single server, you may have different partitions of different users, all mixed up. They are all encrypted addressed, and uh, in transit, uh, this is a very isolated environment, but uh, it is multi-tenant. So other than this, of course, it's a simplified diagram. There's other elements here, like metadata servers, where you have the mapping between users and partitions to storage servers, so you know exactly where to point. But conceptually, this is the idea. This request router is going to be the responsible to talk directly to a single partition. Now, what kind of operations can I do with, with DynamoDB? First of all, there's the single value, single partition operations. Uh, they're called put item, delete item, get item, and update item, basically CRUD operations. How do they work? Very simple, just the way I said, shown in the previous diagram. <clears throat> you compute the hash of the, of the partition key, go to the appropriate shard and operate on that value, read, write, update it, or delete it. Super simple. Then we have multiple value, but single partition operations, like the one called query. This one is uh, um, an operation that applies mostly to um, composite primary keys, where you say, given this hash of this, this value of the partition key, which obviously will map to a single hash value, give me all the values sorted by the sort key. So in other words, using the example that we said before, give me all the readings by this device from this date to this date, for example, or order by date. That's the more, more precise example. Right? And then there's the scan operation, which is multi-value, multi-partitions, uh, which is basically read all data. If you look at the first two, which are the most common operations, they always talk to a single partition, which means to a single server. And this is the key to this latency. They, most of the time, you're basically finding a server and just talking to that server. There is no coordination between shards. There's no talking, there's no data shuffling, uh, there's no data movement between shards. Everything goes to one shard. And then scan operation, which is mostly discouraged to be used on DynamoDB and it's expensive. Um, it may go to multiple shards, but if you really think about it, it's a composition of a query operation. You'll just do it, the order is not warranted, so you can just say, okay, I'll do a query on this partition to return the results. Is the user satisfied? And I was asking for more, and then I'll go to another one, then I'll go to another one. Um, it can also support this operation in parallel. This client says, the client says, okay, I wanna this number of threads, and then it will, it will go depending on some offsets, but there's no order warranty. And uh, it's again, it's just a, a, a superset of scan operations. So at the end, the goal of DynamoDB is try to make almost all operations essentially just go to a single shard and then compose them and avoid across nodes 
coordination or, or, or data shipping, because that is what will kill not necessarily scalability, but this promise of single digit uh, latency. So these are the operations that Dyna DynamoDB has. What are the operations that doesn't have? It doesn't have joins, doesn't have aggregates, doesn't have advanced queries like uh, Windows subqueries. Why? Why is this? Sounds like a huge limitation, isn't it? Well, this is again done by design. If we would allow this kind of operations, we will break this promise of single digit millisecond. If you think about it, at any scale, it is almost impossible to warranty that any of these operations will run uh, under 10 milliseconds. And the reason why is because they require a cross node coordination. You need to ship data from one node or execute an operation in this node and this node and combine the results, for example, for an aggregation. And that will kill this latency promise. So I'm not saying this is necessarily the best model or, or, or is better than others. It is just a compromise as always. DynamoDB architects and, and product uh, managers decided that the strongest promise they wanted to make is the single digit millisecond latency. And then from this, it cascades which operations you may not have as part of the data model. If you're happy with this, that's a fantastic use case and fantastic database for you. If you're not happy with this, you should use something else. But this is the why. So um, how does it scale? At the beginning, when you create a DynamoDB table, you start with a small set of partitions dedicated to you. That's pretty obvious, right? If you just insert a few data every, every, every several minutes, you're not going to get a lot of resources for you. So let's say you start with three partitions. And they have some data on it, as we can see their color here in blue. And at some point, we realize that partition one is almost full. So what we need to do is uh, scale up. To scale out, we'll introduce a new server. On this ring, let's say that this new partition enters in this position between partition one and partition two. According to the ring buffer, uh, the ring topology that we established before for the mapping of values to the shards, to the partitions, we realize that all values between now the segment of circle between partition one and partition four, they're gonna need to be migrated to partition four because before this, they belong to partition two. So in this case, we initiate this uh, data movement. It is typically done online. Uh, so it's running in parallel. So partition four is not active yet. And we're moving some data uh, uh, that is gonna land on partition four. And once all the data is moved, then we can just make it online and, and have scaled up. So yes, it increases a little bit of IO behind the scenes, but it, this is done online. This is using probably some tools like similar to logical replication in Postgres. So this is how DynamoDB works. And up to now, I just described DynamoDB. Now, let's look at Postgres. Can we make Postgres scale like DynamoDB? Again, I'm not saying this is the best way to scale or not. I'm just saying if we want Postgres to scale the same way as DynamoDB does, because apparently a lot of people like this model, then can we do it? And if so, how? Before this, let me take a small break to see if there's any question in the chat that I can address already. If not, I will wait until the end of the session for doing this. OK, I think there's nothing special for now. So that's fine. We'll continue. Uh, if you have further questions or you don't have, write them on the chat and we'll, we'll, we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. All right. Can Postgres scale like DynamoDB? Let's look at the potential models that we may use for this. The first one that should come to mind is using Citus. Citus is an open source extension for Postgres made by previously CytusDB, now Microsoft that allows sharding on Postgres or assists on sharding Postgres. So sounds like similar model to what we're looking for, uh, creating shards, uh, splitting the data into multiple servers, and that's it. So how does Citus work? Citus has a, a node called the coordinator. And this coordinator has some metadata where about the sharding, how, 
how ranges of data are split into multiple shards, what is the IP address of these shards, and so forth, and may also contain local tables. Local tables are tables where the information is not sharded. They're typically small tables, which you may use for local joins. When you want to join some data, for example, that will come from several shards, and at the same time, you want to join it with small lookup table, for example, to, to do a, a more complete view of the information you want to get. You can do that with a local uh, join on the metadata, sorry, on the local tables on the site to score the area. So the key here under this model is that the user connects to the coordinator. This coordinator speaks the Postgres protocol, looks like a Postgres protocol, a Postgres server, regular Postgres server, but then the queries will be sent to the shards. And then the results will come back, will be processed on the coordinator, which might do further aggregation, log joins with local tables, whatever is required, and then return the data to the user. That, that is how it works. And it's a quite powerful model because it allows you to execute a wide range of Postgres uh, supported SQL queries, and they will go to all the shards that is appropriate to resolve this query, return the results, perform aggregations, uh, joins, whatever is required, as I said before, and then return all the results to the user. Now, will this model allow us to scale similarly to what DynamoDB does? Well, in my opinion, no. So this is not to mean that Citus is a bad software. I think it's an excellent software and, and supports a wide range of sharding or scale-out scenarios. But it doesn't support, again, in my opinion, this particular one. If we want to scale like DynamoDB does, there are several limitations here. The first one is the, that it's a single controller. Think about this controller. It has a bit of state. The state is basically both the metadata tables, which includes the information about the shards, plus the potentially local tables that you're using. Is it possible to have a multiple controller? Yes, it is possible. Uh, you can basically set up a uh, usual Postgres, because the control is also Postgres node with the Citus extension. You can use a streaming replication for these and then use a tool like Petroni or, uh, or PG auto failover for high availability, but it's not mainstream. It's not, uh, I don't know if it's really part of the project or not because it's not fully documented as part of the CIDR documentation. It is something that you're gonna need to work on yourself, right? To have multiple controllers to basically avoid a single point of failure. Um, and obviously you cannot use local tables. You need to forget about local tables and only have metadata and, and uh, this replication if you want to have multiple controllers. So in any way, having a single controller doesn't fit exactly this model that we want for scaling like DynamoDB. But then the main reason is that actually, if you recall from this diagram, I mentioned that the coordinator is going to throw the query to multiple shards and then it's going to potentially and then it's going to gather the results back, perform final operations like aggregation, join, joins with local tables if there's any, and then return the results to the user. This involves quite a, few, a, few, a fair amount of processing. So first of all, to determine which shards this query needs to be sent to, you need to parse the query. So actually the query is going to be parsed kind of twice. It's going to be parsed with the coordinator first, and then it's going to be parsed. Then it's going to be sent to the appropriate charts, and it's going to be parsed again and executed again. But then uh, the results may come from several charts. You need to wait until all charts have completed their that query, and then they're going to be reprocessed and aggregated and reshaped or whatever is required on the coordinator and sent back. So we have in both ways of the query execution path extra time run by the coordinator. And uh, it potentially supports more kind, uh, more wide range of operations that we need to. Uh, it supports operations across multiple shards with aggregations, and DynamoDB doesn't support that. So this actually supposes, for this uh, particular case, um, additional performance, uh, in particular latency, uh, extra work to do, right? So, this doesn't give us a warranty that this controller is going to scale well in terms of latency. It may scale in terms of throughput. 
if you, especially if you have multiple controllers. But it doesn't warranty that it will basically process every single query below this 10 milliseconds goal that we have with, with DynamoDB. OK, let's look at another option. Let's use a model proposed for sharding for Postgres for quite several years already, uh, which is a combination of two key technologies that have been introduced in Postgres. One is the Postgres foreign data wrappers. The other one is partitioning. Postgres firing data wrappers is a way to access other Postgres servers from within a Postgres server. So you can have a connection from one, let's call it coordinator node, to multiple external servers called shards. OK, sounds already more or less similar to Citus from this perspective. What I will do then on this coordinator, which will not store any data at all, is to create via partitioning a parent table, which will be the main table that I want to have, and then several partitions. These partitions, instead of being like real partitions or real tables, they will be virtual tables using the foreign data wrapper uh, technology connecting to external shards. So in other words, what we will see on the coordinator is a single partition. It will be in reality a whole server, a whole Postgres server. And because I have partitioning with a parent table, this is very convenient because me as a user, I will just insert or do any query just on the parent table. The Postgres query planner will determine which partitions are involved on this particular query. We'll send the query to these partitions. And these partitions, because they are foreign data wrappers, they will funnel out to the appropriate chart. So this model, uh, which didn't work well uh, until recent versions of Postgres because of limitations on the partitioning performance, partitioning pruning, or the push down capabilities of the foreign data wrappers, as of today, is a quite comfortable model to use. Um, it's almost transparent to the application. You didn't even notice that there are sharding behind the scenes. And it works more or less well with several caveats we'll also see. So is this a good model to simulate scaling like DynamoDB? Uh, does it have any limitations? It does. So first of all, is that the foreign data wrapper technology is not able to push down all the clauses. So if I say where, and then I, send, I specify several conditions, several predicates as part of the query, maybe some of them will not be able to be pushed down to the, rep, to the shards. If this is the case, then we're going to be making the foreign data wrapper infrastructure is going to do wider queries to the shards gather all the data and then filter on the on the this uh, main or coordinator node uh, to, so the result the query results will be correct but uh, we may be shuffling a lot of data from the shards down to the coordinator because of limitations on the foreign data wrapper push down capabilities limitations that are are disappearing with every release every release is getting better and better and better on pushing down more capabilities to the foreign uh, wrapper. But there are still some limitations. There's also this limitation that uh, when talking to multiple shards, it works serially, or I should say it worked, or it's about to stop working serially, uh, because there are some improvements coming here on Postgres 14. But still, um, if you're talking to multiple partitions, which means if your query involves multiple partitions, which will be translated to your query involving multiple shards, this performance of right now the Postgres ex executor will not be optimal. And it will increase the latency potentially. And uh, I haven't run any benchmarks yet with uh, Postgres 14, which is on, on beta stage. Um, I'll be doing this uh, shortly to assess what the performance is. But up to this point, the performance was from a latency perspective, very bad because it was going one by one. It couldn't open many connections at once for executing the query. So it's, it's processing one partition at a time, which means one shard at a time. And so the latency is very bad. The throughput can be good, latency will not. And also because of the number of connections, you really want to have connection pooling. This is not a limitation, but it's, a, it's complicating the architecture. But the main reason, other than these limitations, the main reason is the processing time in the controller. Because we're performing something similar to what we were doing in Citus. It's just a different model of working, but uh, we're having the co co coordinator node here 
parse the query because it actually is the one executing the query that's going to determine the partitions that it's going to send to the partitions. They're just going to wait for the data for potentially one or more partitions. It's going to uh, final uh, stages of the query execution and then it's going to return the results. Um, and for these operations, we're doing extra processing and we cannot warranty that this will scale at the levels that we want in terms of latency. In other words, the latency may skyrocket uh, for certain operations or in certain volumes, which we cannot warranty they will be kept um, below this 10 milliseconds. So what is the solution? The solution is what is called application-based sharding, which is a term that I found in the literature that is not uniformly defined. Some people call this application-based sharding. Some people call this application assisted sharding, some people call this application side sharding, also abbreviated as ASS. Funny stories apart, uh, uh, there's no universal term for this, but, but the concept is, is pretty simple, right? So let's, let's focus on two previous solutions and we'll see that the main reason for not achieving dynamo scale in terms of latency, both for Citus and Postgres for India wrappers plus partitions is essentially the same. It is the coordinator node. We need to eliminate this coordinator to save all this processing time and eliminate all the potential complexity of these queries and parsing the queries at several points. We just need to eliminate the coordinator. If we eliminate this coordinator and have the application, instead of being super transparent and, and not understanding uh, that there's a sharding process behind the scenes, it would tell the application to cooperate and ask the application to be aware of the sharding of the topology and understand the metadata servers where this is going to be played, where the information on, uh, about the shards can be placed and so forth, then we will be able to direct the queries from this application to the appropriate shard. Now, when I mean application, I don't necessarily mean the final user. Final user should be totally transparent for this. But what I mean is that instead of being uh, the user talking to a coordinator and the coordinator doing all this work, what we need to do here is that user talk to some intermediate application layer. And this application layer is directing the query to the appropriate chart. Actually, this is surprising because it sounds pretty similar. You're just replacing the coordinator by an application. How is that going to make it better? Well, the difference is actually substantial because this it's called a request router. I call it request router in DynamoDB. That's a term used by Amazon people. So let's also call it request router here. This request router here is doing a much simpler job than the coordinator on the Citrus or Postgres for the wrapper model. It is not parsing the query. It is not determining how many shards that is need to funnel out to. It's not doing processing after the query is uh, returned from one or multiple shards. It's just extracting from the document the partitioning key partition key, computing the hash, and then directly knowing which server to send this query to, and everything else is left for this server. So the latency introduced by this is a constant because it is it's a cell one. It is just extract the partition key, compute the hash, consult on the metadata tables, which are, should be cached in memory, and then direct to the appropriate chart. And that's it. That's all the work you need to do. And this is independent of the type of query you're doing. It's independent of the volume of data, and so it can be warranted a constant induced latency by this uh, element. So, um, by the way, uh, the last item here is interesting. This will work for all operations in DynamoDB except the scan, because they're all single shard. But as I said before, the scan operation is an operation that can be composed. And I can subdivide a scan into multiple such operations. And the same model will still apply because I don't even need to aggregate all the results of the scan before sending it to the client. I can send the results directly to the client after performing the very first uh, scan on a, on a shard and then operate on another one. So you just need to keep a very tiny amount of metadata information about the operation in memory. But I don't really need to wait until I receive all the results and aggregate them because they're not warranted to be in order. So I can just stream them back directly to the client as soon as they are receiving from a single partition. So basically, the model is still the same and it works this way with this application-based sharding. So let's, let's uh, see this on a diagram. It is probably easier to, to see. 
But this diagram in reality is pretty much similar to what we saw before with DynamoDB. So let's say the user is connecting to a load balancer. This load balancer could be based on DNS or IP, doesn't really matter. The user, from the client perspective, it is just an entry point. Then this load balancer is going to load balance across a fleet of request routers. These request routers are stateless. Uh, they will connect potentially to another external service called the metadata service, where the metadata about the partitions will be there. But it's not really relevant. And then let's say the, the request comes into the first request router according to this diagram. It, then it will extract from the document this partition key, depending, I respect if it's a simple or a composite partition key, will compute the hash and determine this should go to the shard two. And then it will just throw the query to the shard two, pick the result and send it back to the user. And we're done. That's why this, the job done by this request router is much, much simpler and is constant, irrespective of the, of the operation. How could it look like? Well, this is just an exercise of pure simulation. How would we do this in, in Postgres? In reality, because this is a key value store, uh, it's pretty simple. I'll have a document where I will store all the data, including the whole primary key, even if it's simple or composite, and I'll call this content. I'll use JSONB data type in Postgres because it allows us to store a JSONB. And as I said before, the primary key will be cont contained within this, doc within this document, within this content uh, column. Now, if the key is simple, it will only have a partition key. And this partition key has to be a primary key. So in this case, I will create a unique index on the JSONB path expression extract the partition key and let's say a, a standardized and always call uh, partition key uh, field of the document that, for the partition key, right? So I extract from content the partition key and that is a, a, a unique index on that. So basically I create an index on the expression, extract the primary key, the partition key, sorry, from the content to ensure that this value is unique according to the rules that this is the primary key on a simple one. And then I also need to store the hash value for this document according to the hash algorithm that I determine. And this is what will, will allow us to direct the query from the request router because the request router will compute the hash value. And basically the query we're going to be performing in Postgres, once we identify which shard this hash value is stored, which could be by ranges, then I'll say, hey, do insert or do update or do delete or do whatever where the hash value equals this hash value. So it's pretty simple a schema actually. If the pri primary key would be composite, it would be pretty much the same, except that in this case, the unique index that I will be creating for the content part will be extracting the content partition key and the content sort key, because that's what is, determines the uniqueness. And that's it, that's, that's pretty much it. So of course, this is just a, an example of how this could be simulated. Um, it will be, from a Postgres TTL perspective, quite simple. Now, would this architecture scale like DynamoDB or not? Well, first of all, scaling uh, will be essentially linear with the number of shards. Because if you think about it, there's no cross partition operations or cross shards operations. Um, there's no data shuffling. And the operation performed by these request routers is independent of the number of partitions. You're computing the hash, you're, you're extracting request routers, are extracting the, the, sort, uh, sorry, the partition key from the document. They're uh, computing hash value, they're mapping to the ring, they're determining the shard. That's it. It is I respect. It doesn't grow with the number of shards. So yes, the scaling should be essentially linear. Then, because almost all operations are single partition, as I mentioned before, this request router knows exactly which partition to direct. So it will just send the operation to the partition and it will perform the operation. So, so it, it scales essentially on a linear, linear uh, fashion. And as I said, the scan, you can composite with multiple query commands without the need to aggregate results later. So it also scales essentially linearly. Well, the architecture is a bit complex. Uh, I didn't show on this diagram the whole architecture. As I said, you need uh, metadata servers. You need the procedure for resharding if you need to introduce new shards. So it's a quite complex thing. But in reality, it should work. 
So what I would say is that Postgres should be able to scale like DynamoDB. And you know why. The real reason is that in reality, after all, DynamoDB is just this. DynamoDB in reality is just an HTTP application backed by MySQL. There is a comment on, on, on Hacker News uh, some time ago that basically says that DynamoDB is a Java application with MySQL, where Java is a very specialized Java with a lot of, uh, of uh, GNI, which is a native interface. So it's, it's called calling uh, C, C++ components with a very customized MySQL, probably stripped down of many components, it's maybe, more, maybe more just DynamoDB than MySQL, but it doesn't matter. It's built exactly this way. So the final answer to this talk today, which is can Postgres be made to scale like DynamoDB with its good things and bad things, but with the main goal of achieving single digit millisecond operations, the answer is yes. And the way to do it is just to follow the same architecture as DynamoDB does, which is essentially application-based chart. So my final takeaway from this presentation today is you can achieve really good things using some of the available technologies for scaling Postgres like Citus or the model of foreign data wrappers and partitioning. But don't forget the power of application assisted sharding. Because if you make your application sometimes even just a slightly more complex and understand a little bit that some of the operations can be made by talking directly to the appropriate charts, you don't need to go through coordinators. You can avoid coordinators. And in my view, the future of Postgres scale out will be a combination of both using coordinators, either Citus model or the partitioning, uh, partition and foreign interrupters model for the most complex operations, but directly send to the appropriate charts the simpler operations. And you induce later latency and better scale out. So that's uh, mostly what I wanted to say. Uh, just stay tuned because there's going to be benchmarks coming soon. Follow me on Twitter if you want to know more and see the results. And I'm open to questions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, now we are. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so um, let's proceed with the questions. Uh, I'm all here. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, not a lot of time, but 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 anyway. So um, the first question is uh, how, from your point of view, DynamoDB is uh, positioned <coughs> between uh, modern open source uh, key value storages and things like this. Um, so um, of course, some people think that it's sort of a vendor walk. Um, are there any alternatives which bring the same functionality, but uh, just uh, through open source and can be installed on the premises? So what's the difference uh, where on this landscape the number DB is? I, I don't think can be compared. DynamoDB is not that much about the technology more than the provided service. If you want to run something like DynamoDB, even if DynamoDB would be open source tomorrow, it will be huge effort for anyone to build a service like DynamoDB and operate at the scale of DynamoDB. All these servers that I mentioned that you will need to create, the architecture is highly complex. Um, the, all the high availability, the backups, the uh, resharding, those are really complex processes that you will need to run on yourself. It supports behind the scenes also authentication via IAM, which you will need to provide for, for uh, authenticating the requests. Then it also connects to streams like Kinesis streams. If you really want to support global tables, if you really want to support all these things, even if it would be open source tomorrow, it will take months or years for someone to build a service and operate it the same way as DynamoDB does. So it's absolutely vendor lock-in, this is no question. But it's the service that matters here even more than the technology. People like DynamoDB because of its conveniency. You just go, click, create table, boom, start inserting data and start getting data and scales as much as you want with this single digit millisecond crumbs. So I don't think there's anything comparable, either open source or not. But we need to understand it's a service. 
Uh, do you think that some things could be emerged at some point? Because if you take a look, uh, like things like Zenit DB, Zenit Labs, uh, they're actually playing probably on the cloud uh, field, but in total open source way. Uh, so maybe That's something can happen. Yeah, I, I, I definitely like this project and, and I'm, I'm, I have high hopes for it, as well as, as other projects for potentially help the scaling Postgres better, uh, including future improvements to Citrus and the partitioning model. All these technologies are going to contribute to have something that could be more on the way of what DynamoDB does. And by the way, DynamoDB has a lot of limitations also, so I'm not saying it's by far the, per the perfect model. This is a particular use case that has been resulted that be appealing to many and that it scales almost endlessly, right? And so mm -hmm. it's, I, I think there's a lot to learn from here and I wish the Postgres project will take this as learnings and introduce some of these key technologies somehow into orchestration layers that we all could have from an open source perspective. Now we have another question, which is probably related to this, your answer. Um, person asked, uh, which programming language, uh, in your opinion, is suited most to write such a coordinator to allow Postgres scale the way DynamoDB does? Well, um, first of all, it wouldn't be a coordinator, right? As, as I mentioned before, it will be something like an HTTP application. If we look at purely DynamoDB API, is an HTTP API. So you receive an HTTP API, extract the document, it will verify the signature of the, of the request. Uh, if it's authorized, then you just extract the document, extract the partition key, compute the hash direct to the query. I am very biased here because I'm a Java programmer and I believe Java is one of the most practical programming languages out there and not because of the language itself, but rather because of its ecosystem. It has, in my opinion, the largest amount of libraries ecosystem of high performance, very good quality libraries that are open source. You can just plug into your project extremely easily and just use them. And so processing things like HTTP at high performance, a very high performance language, I would say it's ideal for these kind of things. And actually DynamoDB is apparently also built in Java, uh, except for some C, C++ components used that talk directly to the database by passing all the parsing layers. But I would say it's a great language for this, but there could be others obviously. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We are um, almost guys, yeah. run out of time. <laughs> uh, and yeah, we we're actually a little bit over time already. Yeah. 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 We invite okay. Alvaro to the um, Q&A uh, room, the separate one. Yep. Uh, there would be I'll instructions be on Slack. And uh, those who still have uh, questions can ask uh, them there. So, Alvaro, thank you for coming. Uh, that was a Pleasure. nice talk. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, after short pause, we will welcome um, Federica Campoli uh, with the next talk.